evening all. Uh, very good evening to Justice Sonia Jilu. I didn't expect you sir here. I thought uh, it was for your juniors. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be amongst lawyers at any time as judges. After all, we were lawyers for a long time before we came to the other side of the fence. Now, before going into the topic of the day, let me share a famous quote about the profession of law. Joseph Story, an American jurist and judge of the United States Supreme Court said, I quote, law is a jealous mistress and requires long and constant courtship. It is not to be won by trifling favors, but by lavish homage. By, if you can understand the import of it, we know that a lawyer or a legal professional must dedicate himself absolutely to the profession. That is the nature of the requirement of this profession. And uh, Sir Edward Clerk Casey lays down three steps for success in the profession, three requirements for success in the profession. They are infinite capacity for hard work. And the second one is more startling, to have no money. And the third one, to be very much in love with the work you do. If these three, these three things are there, according to Sir Edward Clark, a legal professional will be successful. And uh, Judge Abbott Pari says, seven lamps of advocacy. Now I will shift to the advocacy alone. Judge Abbott Pari says there are seven lamps of advocacy. They are honesty, courage, industry, wit, eloquence, judgment, and fellowship. Now, Bhagavad Kevi Krishnaswami here was a famous lawyer in, in the late 40s, early 40s, had added one more to this, one more lamp, that is tact. In his famous book, titled Professional Conduct and Advocacy, which is a compilation of lectures of Rav Bhagavad K.V. Krishnaswami here, rendered to a group of apprentices in the year 1940, Krishnaswami Ayer refers to these seven lamps suggested by Judge Abbott Parry and adds the last lamp, namely tact, to it. A lawyer needs tact according to him. And by now, we all know that the judiciary is an institution which is a lost resort for the common people. And what is the role of the lawyer in that institution? The judiciary protects the rights of the citizens, it enforces their duties and obligations, and the noble provision of law, which aids and assists the court in dispensation of justice, must necessarily maintain a very high and noble conduct. To use the words of Blackstone, legal profession is a science which distinguishes right and wrong and it teaches to establish the right and to prevent, punish, or redress wrong. A very beautiful definition of legal profession. There, can be, there cannot be a much shorter definition of the legal profession than this. Often, we have seen people criticizing lawyers for propagating something against their own views. See, normally the impression is, a oh, lawyer, he will talk lies, he will talk lies. That is, the, that is the normal common man's vision of a lawyer. And that notion is based on, according to Macmillan, a misconception. Macmillan says, once you understand the vital point of an advocate, of advocacy is that the advocate he is engaged in not expressing his own views of the cause, but his client's views. Once that is understood, Macmillan says that misconception will go, or an advocate cannot be charged with that 
what he calls an insincerity because he is propagating something against his own thoughts coming to professional contact it is not something very different from normal human contact you should remember that nothing morally wrong can be professionally right but the converse cannot be true and that something which is morally right can be professionally wrong also a lawyer must keep his conduct above board so that the success he achieves in the profession will stay with him if the conduct goes become shady or is not in line with the strict standards required the success that is achieved may be very temporary and it may be lost very quickly also there is a general feeling that standards of the profession have gone down standards of the profession have gone down people start saying standards of the profession have gone down as judges are not very what you call uh, patient as they used to be this is a general charge that is made against the judges also i must tell you in 1920 there is a letter of early norton the famous barrister who practiced in madras written to his friend sadagopacharya in the year 1920 this letter you will find in the book called a century completed published by the madras high court in the year 1962 when it completed 100 years there not in laments that the patient hearing has gone even in 1920 he laments that patient hearing is not there therefore it is not as if there is a slight now every person who see for a lawyer who enrolled in 1950s yes today the profession standards professional standards have gone down for a lawyer who enrolled in 1920 in 1950 the standards have gone down it is like that every profession has got that uh, see anybody says always yesterday was better that is that is human tendency everybody would say yesterday was better and i was in fourth standard this happened when i was in law college this happened now law college is now, now of course we can't say that about law colleges now law colleges have become a uh, very beautiful institutions and with the advent of national law schools they have so much turn in the legal education and i am happy and proud to say that i i was a student of pondicherry law college which had contributed at least four professors who were responsible for establishing national law schools all over india mr nr madhav manan professor nr madhav manan was the visionary he was the first academician principal of the institution so let me not digress into that and uh, coming back the of course we must concede with a little amount of guilt that the standards in the profession have gone down a bit but that that is not a permanent affair i am confident that with the advent of this law schools and the new breed of young lawyers who are coming into the profession today i think this profession will again we back on its rails and with the same old glory which it possessed earlier and but these evil influences come from outside as well as from within there are people inside the profession who try to always try to bring it down as the famous saying goes the citadel never falls from outside it falls from within so then came the earlier we had the legal professional act legal practitioners act then came the advocate side then the bar councils were set up then part 6 of the bar council of india rules provides rules governing the conduct of advocates and chapter 2 of part 6 relates to conduct of lawyers the professional conduct and etiquette the preamble itself is very very lucid where it says an advocate to, uh, requires an advocate to comport himself in a manner befitting his status as an officer of the court a privileged member of the community and a gentleman bearing in mind what may be lawful and moral for a person who is not a member of the bar or for a member of the bar in his non professional capacity 
may still be improper for an advocate. That's why I said the converse may not be correct. When you say that the converse, if you look at the rules, a member of the bar, a privileged member of the community and a gentleman, bearing in mind that what may be lawful and moral for a person who is not a member of the bar, or for a member of the bar in his non-professional capacity, may still be improper for an advocate. So this very preamble suggests that an advocate, an advocate requires to maintain far better standards than what is required of a normal person. All advocates have to maintain that standard. And this is the, and why, why, why is this requirement? Because the relationship between a lawyer and his client is based basically on trust. It operates on trust. A client has to believe the lawyer. And, uh, and there is a trust between the judges and the lawyers also, the court and the lawyers. The court has to believe the lawyers. So when this, the entire profession and the entire judiciary, which is built on a module of trust, if the standards of, high standards are not maintained, the decay or the deterioration will be very fast. That is why they say that you must have a complete standard, a better standard than that of a normal man. This is the reason why the communications between a lawyer and his client are also privileged. And they did not, they, a lawyer cannot be forced to say whatever his client told him. So, and the Bar Council of India rules is divided into four parts if you look at it. The first part says the duty towards the court. And uh, my feeling is that the, the, these parts are also arranged according to their importance. The first part is duty to the court. Second part is duty to the client. The third part is duty to the opponent. And the fourth part is duty to the colleague. And there is a fifth part which is not stated in the rules, but the fifth part is duty to the society. The lawyer owes a duty to the society because a lawyer's actions or the court's actions have a greater impact on the society than any other profession. I don't want to repeat the rules and emphasize what has been stated there. My endeavor would be to broad base the rules and remind young lawyers of their duties as members of the noble profession of advocacy. As I said in the opening remarks, which is morally wrong can be professionally correct, but nothing which is morally wrong can be professionally correct, but the corners may not always be correct. Something which is morally correct may be professionally wrong, for example, advertising. Any professional, any person doing a business or carrying on a profession can advertise, but a legal professional is barred from advertising. That is because, so what is morally correct? Something which is morally correct for a general person, for a layman, is legally incorrect for a legal person. So, a satisfied, then how do you, how do you pick up practice in the bar? See, I walked in as a first-generation lawyer in 1986 into this high court. I didn't know where the chamber was on the day I entered because, as you know, the old law chambers, those people who know Madras High Court, the old law chambers have a peculiar system of numbering. That is, the odd numbers will be on one side, even numbers will be on the other side. My senior did not come to court on the first day I attended court. He said he go to 33 law chambers. I got a bus from Mailapur, went to the high court, got down, got into this rent building. In those days, we never had these internships where these kids, young kids today familiarize themselves with the court even before they enroll. And from the first year, they start coming into internship program. So I went inside. I found the 30, 34 was there, 36 was there, 32 was there, 33 was not there at all. I went round and round. By the time I found my chamber, it was 11.30. The clerk was fuming. He said, why are you coming late on the first day itself? Then I had to tell him, look here, I need to find the chambers. So it was, and we had no cell phones in those days to ask somebody also. So they, they, this was the position. And uh, then how do I pick up clients? You say, you, I cannot advertise. And uh, nobody knows that I am practicing as a lawyer. How do I pick up clients? A satisfied client is the best advertiser for a lawyer. If a client is satisfied with their performance and he goes and informs others or his litigant friends that this lawyer is good, and like that, you will start adding briefs. A satisfied client 
who is happy with your work is the best advisor and his recommendation never fails but uh, and you now you can see the legal profession has got so many if you look at rule 36 of the bar council of india rules it says that the name board of a lawyer must be of a reasonable size and you cannot put i can't say i uh, see as a lawyer there are many lawyers who are into politics there are many lawyers who are members of the bar council of india bar council of tamil nadu the rule is very specific it says rule 36 it says that a lawyer's name board shall be of a reasonable size and it shall not include any political or any other post held by him in that we find now today visiting card saying so and so advocate former member of parliament so and so advocate former legislative mla so and so advocate member of the bar council of india those things should not be there there, there is a prohibition against those things and it says the rule says that the board should be of a very reasonable size and you can't advertise then this this question this very size of the board name board of a lawyer came up for consideration before a division bench of the madras high court in volume 80 law weekly page 153 td sekidar versus bar council of tamil nadu where the high court said these rules are proper and they should be followed the division bench of the high court has considered particularly rule 36 and said this is the high standard that is prescribed for the lawyers and the, the profession the standard and etiquette required in the profession was considered by the division bench and they upheld these rules they said these rules are there so you you cannot have all these things and you cannot do all these things as a lawyer by far you look at in the legal profession has not gone into advertising as a long way in a long way but there are of course some websites where particulars are put up and people call you and ask you what is your specialization i want to put it in the website that itself is not correct but it is happening bar council is also not taking any action against that but unlike the medical profession which has been in my view hijacked by corporate hospitals and chain hospitals legal profession remains unadulterated even today though there are big firms big law firms which have come up now having offices all over the place a individual lawyer has become a rarity today but these legal firms also are not into advertising in a wrong way in a in a commercial manner so that aspect this advertising aspect has to be got in has to be remembered and uh, as i said the best advertisement is a satisfied client then what you should be guarded against is influence by the litigants some of the litigants what they do is they try to influence the opposite lawyer by offering him cases suppose i have many cases as a litigant i have many cases and this has happened to me this most of the things are out of personal experience when i was arguing a case for for one of the parties the other side client though it is a high court he was not expected to be present he was present the respondent was present after i finished the case it was a small interlocutory application after i finished the case this guy walked up to me and said i am so and so i want you to appear for me in other cases not not this not that litigation particularly but he said i want you to appear for me in other cases and i told him why why are you go to the same lawyer he said no 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 i saw you arguing you are doing really well so i want you to appear and i said sorry of course there is no bar legally there is no bar you can appear but morally it may not be right because he is paying you for the other case also so if he pays you a, a few hundred rupees a few thousands more than what your client the already existing client for whom he is appearing against that person has paid you may have a slight tendency to lean towards him even that you should not allow those kind of influences are there particularly for a young lawyer these things will definitely have a bearing so avoid appearing when there is a conflict of interest and uh, rule th- and uh, then comes the lawyer who is likely to be a witness in an up case 
in this question whether a lawyer can appear in a case where he could be a material witness was a raging controversy before the advent of the bar council of india rules there are several judgments on that then some judgments taking the view there is nothing wrong in this appeal some judgments saying that if he is not a material witness he can there are various cases on this but finally the bar council of india rules rule 13 as it stands today said no a, a lawyer who is likely to be a witness in a case cannot appear for any of the parties in that litigation then can a lawyer say because tell a client that he would not appear for him because his cause is not just these are all things which would come in the way of a young lawyer when he accepts an engagement can a lawyer say that you cannot uh sorry you don't have a case so i will not appear for you no that is not done because lord bromwell said a man's rights ought to be determined by the court and not at his attorney's office so the decision is it is for the court to decide on the correctness or just cause of your client but you cannot refuse to appear saying your cause is not just at the same time you can tell him that he is likely to fail or he is likely to lose the battle because of a stated position of law that is against him or because of a factual issue which has been decided against him by the courts or even at the inception you can say that the court will not accept this you can tell him but if the client still says no matter what it is you please appear a lawyer need not refuse to appear he can still appear for the client what about an accused who confesses for a crime if an accused confesses to a crime and says still defend me should the lawyer say no the answer is no even then you cannot say no if the accused confesses and says even because the criminal jurisprudence is totally different criminal law requires a person who is charged with an offense to be proved guilty beyond all reasonable doubts and he is presumed to be innocent till the guilt is proved by the prosecution therefore again it is not for the lawyer to decide whether the client is guilty or not if the client concedes or confesses that he is guilty the lawyer can still appear for him there is nothing wrong in that and there are also two stages in that kiri krishna swami here in his book points out two stages there one is prior and one is after if the confession is prior to the acceptance of the engagement the lawyer can say because you have confessed to me i will not appear for you go to another lawyer but that lawyer is duty bound to warn him and tell him that don't go again there and confess to that lawyer also therefore what they have said is don't if you want to confess you if a client if a client confesses to you you take his brief or if he doesn't con- take his brief or if you don't want to if you feel that you will be tied by the confession you will not be able to do justice to that case then you refer to refer him to the to the to another lawyer but tell him that tell that client please don't go there and confess that that you must maintain if the confession is after the acceptance of the engagement then the lawyer is duty bound to defend the client with all legitimate means at his disposal the paragraph 5 of the code of professional ethics promulgated by the american bar association which reads as follows may be very relevant in these circumstances a lawyer may undertake with propriety the defense of a person accused of a crime although he knows or believes him guilty and having undertaken it he is bound by all fair and honorable means to present such defenses as the law of the land permits to end to the end that no person may be deprived of life or liberty by due process so 
a criminal lawyer has got this protection even if there is a confession he can still appear and defend the client with all with all fair and honorable means and to protect his life and liberty the next question not the least but very important is the fee what is the relationship but as far as the fee is concerned the rules govern it and earlier there were a lot of these mitigations whether there can be a, a there can be a, a back fee agreement or whether there can be a contingent fee agreement or whether the lawyer can finance the litigation all those things are now been settled under the rules there cannot be you cannot have a contingent fee agreement that if i succeed if you get 100 rupees you should pay me 20 rupees such a kind of an agreement is bad you cannot have that agreement then you cannot have a back fee agreement that is if i don't succeed i will repay the fee that also is bad then but should a lawyer say no if the client is poor the even even before the advent of legal services free legal aid and other things the experts have our peers in the profession have suggested that you you do certain amount of legal service certain amount of free legal aid appear for some poor clients also and you should not refuse a brief because the client is unable to pay you the fee and then the contingent fee back fee or right of a lawyer to advance money is all those things have been rule 32 bars lawyers from advancing monies for conduct of the litigation and lawyers are also prohibited from bidding at the court auction for purchasing actionable claims in a litigation where they have appeared for the parties the rules also bar lawyers from charging what is called a contingent fee these are the things which have now come in the form of rules and these are all the general duties very important things which may again and again occur now let me go to the duties of a lawyer towards the court what is the duty of the lawyer to the court while the broad rules relating to general ethics as i said earlier the lawyers also have a duty to a court the first duty towards the court is to be respectful to the court the duty to be respectful is not for the sake of the incumbent of the judicial office it is the respect is not to the judge as the person the respect is to the office for maintenance of its supreme importance you respect a judge because he is a judge not because he is r subramanian because he is a judge he is respected that is why they say the duty to be respectful is not for the sake of the incumbent of the judicial office but for the maintenance of its supreme importance being respectful however does not mean that you should accept whatever the judge says you can be respectful at the same time you can be assertive of the rights of your client also when we say assertive it does not mean that you have to always raise your voice come to the desk and argue many lawyers have that notion being assertive means shouting at the top of their voice no that is not being assertive that is really being disrespectful to the court so shouting at the top of some lawyers cannot talk even i was accused when i was a lawyer i was accused of uh, raising my voice many times but uh, raising your voice depends on the situation see if you want to be very assertive if you want to put across a point and the other other side is not there are some lawyers who are very uh, who think that they will not they should not allow the other side to argue they think that is advocacy the when the such kind of lawyers are appearing against you and they keep on interrupting you you have to raise your voice and tell them please keep on see those things happen but being assertive is not raising your voice and shouting at the top of your voice at the judge therefore you should maintain a very cool composure when you are inside the court never allow your composure to whittle down you must present a very pleasant picture when you are inside the court that makes the judge also feel that this guy is good that impression you must create now i will not delineate on this because yesterday anand has spoken about uh, justice anand has spoken about all that 
but I thought I must, what, wherever he has left out a little, I will fill up the gaps today. Then uh, there are certain other duties towards the court. I go quickly point by point. A lawyer arguing a case must stay through the hearing. He should not leave midway. He or she should be present in court to take the judgment. Lawyers should avoid exhibiting familiarity with the judge in the court. I personally know of an occasion where one of the very famous lawyers in the Madras High Court was arguing. The judge and that lawyer were from the same office. When he presented a citation, the lawyer said, well, Lord, our office case, and gave the paper across the bar. The judge retorted, we are not, we don't belong to the same office anymore. See, this is like, don't, don't try to familiarize yourself with the judge inside the court. It may be, because after all, we judges are also, the, the, are also part of the bar earlier. I was a part of the Madras bar for 30 years and I have now become a judge. That doesn't mean I should not be friendly with any of the lawyers. See, they are, we are still friends outside the court. But inside the court, don't exhibit your friendship or your familiarity with the judge while you are arguing it. That is one aspect which the lawyer should have in mind. Then don't talk about the case to a judge before whom it is listed. There are people who do that, who will sometimes uh, these exchanges like this, when it, when it is understood by the litigant, will have a very bad impact on the litigant. He will think that, oh, my lawyer is very close to the judge, so I will succeed. No, you should never give such an impression to a litigant who thinks that who, that he would, he would succeed in a case because his lawyer is very close to the judge or his lawyer exhibits himself to be very close to the judge. Then maintain the courtesy and composure, even when the judgment goes against you. Sometimes it so happens that it is bound to happen. It is very quite human, quite normal. And when a judgment goes against you, a lawyer tends to make a sly remark against the judge. That, that should be very scrupulously avoided. I was a victim of such imprudence in very early days of my profession. When I lost a case which I thought I will definitely succeed, I, the judge had reserved orders and he had pronounced it after he said my case was dismissed. I came out and in that momentary frustration, I said something just outside the court. I, when I gave the bundle to my clerk, I said something and I just gave the bundle. And that clerk who was, asked, who was born in 1963, who joined my office in 1963, that is the year I was born, he was there till the, this happened sometime in 1989. By the time that man has almost finished 26 years of service. And I was about two years old as a lawyer. And uh, he just looked at me, took the papers and said, come, let's go. He just pulled me out of the place and went. That very evening, my senior asked me, what did you say outside the court hall numbers first? Then I had to confess. Then we, my, you know what my senior told me? that even the bricks in the red building have ears and mouths. They hear and they talk. Therefore, be careful. Don't make such comments. To my shock and surprise, I came to know that it was that judge who had called my senior and told him to tell your junior to not to do this. See, my comment has reached the judge. Therefore, you must be very careful in that you should never react to a judgment if it goes against you. Keep your cool, work out your rights. Yesterday, Anand was also emphasizing this. I wanted to say this because I have a personal experience of this. I was a victim of such imprudence once. Then, when you are arguing a case, you have to argue a case where you find that you have no case at all. And uh, sometimes we know the judges also. We, uh, we know that the, this judge may not accept this particular point. Then it's always prudent to give up. Give up in the sense, don't press hard for a losing cause. If you know that it is a losing cause, don't press hard. Give up. This will create an impression in the mind of the judge 
that all right, this young man or this lawyer will not argue a case which is not worth arguing. If you create that impression, that is like a bank deposit. And you can withdraw from that depression. When you have a 50% case, you can press ahead. You love, if you give up a case which you know that you are not going to succeed, if you tell the judge that fairly, he will fairly concede, there was an article a few days back that Mr. Vijayaraman had written about senior counsel Jairaman, S.V. Jairaman, who passed away recently, who stood up and told the judge, allow the appeal. I don't have a case, you allow the appeal. Like that. Then, if you do that once or twice, the respect for you in the mind of the judge increases multifolds. And I call it, I call these things as initial deposits made to a bank account. These are like the deposits. You make, you concede a case, you have 50 points in your deposit. In the next case where you have 50% case, you can withdraw 25 of them. And the judge will be more considerate towards you. This is what uh, K, K. V. Krishnasamy calls tact. The tact of a lawyer. These things you must inculcate. That, that's why, why, why do we have this Gurukul system for our profession alone? Why do we have the seniors, juniors, you must work in the office of an attorney, you must be a junior, we had apprenticeship earlier, why all this? It is only to enable juniors to learn all these things. These things will have to come by practice. No law college can teach you this. Any amount of uh, reading cannot teach you these practical aspects of behavior in court, what the judge must do, what the, you must assess the judge also. Once you go and sit in the court, I have seen, my when I joined my senior, he was 59 years old. He was, he was already having 26 years of practice. But when there is a new elevated judge coming, he, he would have been a lawyer. He would have, that judge would have been a lawyer in the Madras High Court. They would have been friends, in, even in Wada Poda terms. They would have been so close. But still, once a judge from 34, a lawyer from 34 law chambers, which is just behind our chambers, or elevated. As soon as he was elevated, I found my senior going and sitting in his court, even though he didn't have any case. Two or three days, this man would continuously go and sit in that particular judge's court and watch. Then I asked my clerk, why, why is this man going and sitting there? Because my senior was known to, once he finishes his work, he will go home. He will not stay in the court. But I found, I found very, this, uh, this very surprising. I asked my clerk. My clerk said, no, no, he wants to know how the judge is. He wants to assess the judge. These things you must learn. These things, where will you learn? No law college can teach you all this. You should go sit. There is a new judge. You go sit there and watch the judge, how, how he reacts, how he works, how he puts questions, whether he likes to, whether he likes interruptions while he is talking. All those things these people will assess. These things you will have to practice only by going and sitting in the court and And the, uh, these small, small things you must learn when you were a junior. One day my senior finished his case at 11.30 and left the court. I had no other case also. I also left the court immediately. And uh, I overtook his car on the beach road and went home. Evening I entered the office at about 6 o'clock. He asked me, when did you come back home? I said, by 12 I was home. He said, no, you should not do that. I am 60 years old. I have been with the dog's years into this profession. So I can come back early. But you shall not. You must stay there. Watch. Go watch the other seniors argue. He named a few seniors who were there like uh, uh, Imar Narayan Swami, Lorenz Swaminathan, a lot of senior lawyers, VP Raman. He gave some names and said, you go and sit and watch how they argue. You must watch the judge also. These are all things which you should learn as you pick up in the profession. In, uh, as one, one case which I wanted to refer, that is Mayors vs. Elman, reported in 1940 appeal cases 282. In that case, if you read that judgment, we all should be happy that the power 
disciplinary powers over lawyers has been taken over by the bar council and it is no longer with the court because the house of lords suggest very strict standards for a lawyer now they go to the extent of saying you are liable for even a mistake committed by your clerk you cannot say it is your clerk who committed the mistake and you are not responsible the house of lords says you are liable for the mistakes of your clerk you cannot put anything in an affidavit which you know to be false this is what they have said that the house of lords has gone to the extent of concluding it will be professional misconduct to prepare and present to a court an affidavit of documents sworn to by a client containing statements which the practitioner knew or must have suspected to be false so that was the standard that was required of the lawyer if nowadays what we do for the affidavits affidavit of documents which is there in the computer cut and paste if if these standards are to be followed then most of most of the lawyers today i'm not saying blaming you but that has come these things have come to stay certain things which like uh, filing an affidavit for setting aside an expatri expatri order my rule 13 application setting aside an expatri decree and uh, my senior used to have a lot of cases from this area called namakkal a district called namakkal in tamil nadu and uh, in almost all the cases filed under order 9 rule 13 the affidavit would say i had come to court i was sitting outside in the, under the neem tree in the court campus by the time i could get up and come inside i was at expat one of the judges of the madras high court asked me subramanian have you ever gone to namakkal court campus and he wanted to know whether there was a neem tree at all because every second affidavit he finds this reason so and these things even these things were considered uh, that is that there was so much of meticulous or meticulous scrutiny into a conduct of a lawyer in those days that was such high standards that this profession demand demanded and even now it demands because the reason is that this profession the lawyers plead the cause of others and the judges decide the fate of others a judgment a mistake in a judgment may lead to a innocent person losing his liberty and life in a criminal case a mistake a mistake a mistake in judgment in a civil case a wrong judgment in a civil case may lead to a millionaire becoming a pauper overnight or a pauper becoming a millionaire overnight you are playing with another man's fate a lawyer is arguing a cause of another man a judge is deciding a cause of another man you are playing with another man's fate that's why the standards that are set for this profession were much higher than any other profession in the world now these are the duties to the court now let me travel to the duties to the profession what are the duties you have towards your profession a lawyer's duties to the profession can be summarized i will give it out in points keep up the best traditions of the bar number 1 keep up the best traditions of the bar never be a party to the lowering of standards of the profession do not pursue the profession in the spirit of competition and rivalry with your brethren the fourth one is more important this was said in 1940 and not in 2020 do not underbid do not keep out your brother practitioner do not indulge in scandal mongering about a brother lawyer do everything to encourage the spirit of comradeship and brotherhood and to avoid barren graces of the nil admirari always be prepared to subordinate yourself to personal interest to those of the pro- subordinate your personal interest to those of the profession treat your seniors with respect and show them sympathy and show sympathy and kindness to your juniors never refrain from giving help to a brother member or generously acknowledging the help given by him. see these are the 10 commandments issue uh, as duties towards of, of a lawyer towards the profession and important of this are most important of this are keep up the high traditions of the profession 
do not pursue the profession in the spirit of competition and rivalry with your brethren do not underbid and do not keep out a brother practitioner do everything to encourage the spirit of comradeship in the profession always be prepared to subordinate your personal interest to those of the profession if your interest is conflict with the interest of the profession give priority to the profession service these are all the 10 commandments which are treated as duties a lawyer owes to the profession and even in your dealings professional dealings outside the court a lawyer must remember he is the trustee of the honor and prestige of the profession you are a trustee and of the honor and prestige of the profession if you must behave the entire profession will be blamed already we are having enough with more and more people to blame us oh lawyers they are always they always lie in court that is that as I, as i already pointed out it is based on a misconception they do not know what is the duty of a lawyer so these things when when you are outside the profession try to preserve its honesty uh, preserve the dignity of the profession and don't barter away the honor and dignity of the profession for small favors that's why we said the profession is like a jealous mistress it requires you to always concentrate on it like a mistress and keep it happy always i many of you i, I don't know whether all of you would have read this there's a tamil novel titled my lot which was published in a weekly magazine called kalki in the 60s and every issue you know this weekly magazines will come with this continuous stories that every issue there will be a, a, a like a, like this uh, serials tele serials we used to have this novels i don't know whether they are coming because i have stopped reading all these weekly magazines now this particular novel my lord deals with court lawyers their lifestyle whole lot of it and in every issue of the magazine kalki when this novel in the pages where this novel appears there is to be a small uh, tidbit like uh, some some humor some humor in court or something relating to court some act relating to the high court of judicature at madras and one of them i distinctly remember having read that there was a judge called sir william gentle who was not very gentle an english judge who was supposed to be very tough and a junior lawyer was sent to his court to inform the judge that his senior has been blessed with a child of that morning and therefore he is not able to come to court that day and seek an adjournment this junior was see in those days this junior walks up to the court and he was he was already scared because this justice gentle is not a very gentle man and he hates people asking adjournments this lawyer got up gathered his wits and said my lord i lord just may have this case tomorrow to get to the why my lord my senior has given birth to a male child what the judge started laughing and said what a great feat it adjournment by a month junior was so happy that he came up to the, the lawyer and said this judge has adjourned the case by a month and the lawyer asked him why why what did he say i told you delivered a mail to <laughs> the senior also burst into laugh that these things like that it will come and in that case that novel this uh, author depicts a lawyer's clerk and the sequence is like this I, i can't repeat the exact sequence but i remember it the sequence is like this this lawyer's clerk who also doubles up as a tout brings a client he is a clerk of ex lawyer he takes a litigant to y lawyer and tells him you have to appear and normally when these clerks bring clients you know what they expect they want some something some uh, some compensation for their chari- very charitable act of bringing a client to you 
a problem there. And uh, the sequence goes like this. And this lawyer, as soon as this fellow comes and says that I have brought a client, this lawyer tells his junior that probably that fellow names that senior, that the master of this clerk, that lawyer who, who to whom this clerk is employed, that Mr. X, and says probably this Mr. X has not paid him this commission for the case which he brought him last week. So today this fellow has brought the client here. And he chides him and tells him, go take the client to your master, why do you bring him here? So that kind of, uh, this happens, this is visualized by an author in 1960s. That means this, these things were prevalent even in those days. I'm only trying to tell you that it is not something new that is happening now. Of course, it is happening in a larger scale today. And, uh, and the 10 points which I just read, read to you were culled out from the book as I already referred to, Professional Conduct and Advocacy, which is a collection of lectures by K.V. Krishnaswamy I had I had that book. I donated it to the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu with a request to them to reprint it and publish it. They said they will do it. And they are in the process of doing it. And it is a book which every lawyer must read at least once in his life. To know what kind of a glorious profession we are in and what was the importance of this profession and what are the what is the conduct is he gives it in 10 chapters duties to each one each one of our to your client to your opponent to your to the bar to the society everything is discussed in very minute details and most of it whatever i have picked up i have picked up from only from that book the name of the book is professional conduct and advocacy it was it is a compilation of lectures Done during the year 1940. It was first edition was published in 1940, and the second edition was published in 1945. And uh, the foreword to the first edition was by Chief Justice Lionel Leach, who was the Chief Justice of the Madras High Court at that time. Even in that foreword in 1940, the Chief Justice laments that the profession is overcrowded. I shudder to think what he would have done if he is alive today. In 1940, he says the profession is overcrowded, and what is that we have today? And one more thing which I wanted to, and the recent past, that is in the three years where I have been a judge of the High Court, I find that a lot of these change of accolades coming. This change of accolades is a very, very, very dangerous thing to happen for the profession. And most of these change of occurrence come up because with, a, with an object to avoid a particular judge or a particular court. You people as lawyers must, you owe a duty to the court as well as the duty to the profession. Suppose I sit in a particular portfolio today and I express something against a particular lawyer or his cause. Next day, that lawyer is changed. The lawyer goes out of the brief, and a new lawyer comes in and says, I have got change of color, I have entered appearance only today, so please adjourn the case. Because after the advent of Madurai bench, what happens is the sittings in the high court change once in three months. So they know that after three months, this judge won't be there. So once this judge goes, then the other judge comes in. So you can take a chance with them. This happens. Sometimes counsels are engaged, relatives of the judge or juniors of the judge are engaged so that this case will go out of the court. That is, I, my request will be to lawyers to avoid this change of occurrence. And there are some officers in Madras who don't accept change of accounts. I don't say you must not accept change of accounts. If you find that the other lawyer is unable to do it, or he has got some other inconvenience, he says, you please appear. Yes, you can. There are some cases where the lawyer gets elevated, or his juniors are not able to manage. It's a big case. All right. There is a change of accounts. Fine. 
but this change of vocal is happening after the case has started and it is in a partial state one day one lawyer will argue and the judge will say something against that point the next day a new lawyer will come and say i have filed change of vocal and give me two weeks time like that it goes and it is pushed for three months they find that there is another judge so these these are all see this is reflect very bad very badly on the profession and what will the litigant think a litigant is also a party to all this and a litigant does not know how to get a change of a ballot whether he should be it is all suggested by our friends in the profession only these things should be scrupulously avoided they are known and of course clients are your masters you have to say do what the client says but at the same time if you look at the bar council rules also the duty to the court and the duty to the profession are superior to the duty you owe to your client and now going to duty to your client and one more thing before i go to the next duties to the client now today we find lot of young lawyers coming to court without the case paper he comes stands both hands free he says please have it next week and for myself i can tell you that's the worst thing that can happen to a lawyer and once i see a lawyer doing that whenever he stands up till i retire i will not take his submission serious that is that, that is such an impression that is created by such behavior and i would only blame seniors for this conduct of juniors seniors must ensure that the juniors go to court with with the case papers even if he is going to take an adjournment let him carry the papers or can't he carry a bundle and walk to the court this is really something which according to me is criminal breach of trust i already said the very relationship is based on trust and you the client has believed you trusted you has entrusted the case to you and your junior walks to the court without the bundle and if the judge puts a question he is unable to answer the judge gets wild dismisses the case for that so you are bartering away the right of your client you are surrendering the right of your client for a peaceful hearing a wholesome hearing of the case so please ensure that no counsel whether senior senior or junior walks into the court without the court papers any court they did be a magistrate court or the supreme court don't walk into the court without the case papers if you have misplaced your case papers tell the judge that it has been misplaced else they just walk in they allow one one bit of bit paper in his hand and he will start saying something so that that should be avoided these things which will create a bad impression on the court on you in the court should be avoided then duty to the client what are the duties of a lawyer towards his client it is this, it is to work for the welfare of the client and to achieve success in his cause undoubtedly that is the primary duty you have to try and win a case for your client no matter yes but there are other things also account for his money the client gives you excess money account for his money communicate an unfavorable result promptly if you succeed you can delay it by one or two days if you lose inform the client on the same day return his papers on completion of the case do not reveal any privileged communication or information that you come across during the course of your relationship do not appear when there is a conflict of interest this is very interesting what is conflict of interest there are there are two con two ways that is one is you may have a personal conflict of interest that is you might have appeared for the other side in some other case then you can say i have appeared for him so i cannot appear for you there will be a conflict of interest there is another legal conflict of interest which may happen see in in one judgment sometime in 1980 justice krishna ayer doubted the validity of a provision for arrest Made under Section 52 of the Code of Civil Procedure, execution by arrest, 52C. 
50C provides for execution of uh, execution of decrees by arrest. Justice Krishna here doubted the constitutional validity of the provision. He said this land, India is a country of poor, the Dardana Rayanas. That is the term he used, Dardana Rayanas. That is a very famous thing. And that, that apart, I am going to tell you a different angle. This judgment of the court, Supreme Court, prompted people to file repetitions challenging Section 50C, 52C, saying that it is constitutionally invalid. And hundreds of repetitions were filed in the Madras High Court also. These repetitions came up for final hearing in very early days of my profession. And one big lawyer in Madras had filed, see in all these repetitions, the creditors in the execution petitions were also made parties and stay of the execution petitions was sought. There was a stay also. And one famous lawyer in Madras had filed some repetitions and he had also entered appearance for the creditors as respondents in other cases. Now there became a conflict. The judge pointedly asked that person, which side are you going to argue? Then, then only he realized, because we do not know. If will be, uh, particularly for the appellate side, if, if you appeared in the appellate side of the High Court, you will know that Akalats will come, there will be uh, just a notice form, uh, Akalats will come, the lawyer will say, please enter appearance, immediately file the account. You don't see what is the case. This happened, and uh, and that too, if you, are, if you are not a very prominent lawyer, you can, it, it, this won't be noticed. If it's a prominent lawyer with whom this happened, it will be noticed. So it so happened for this lawyer, it became a very embarrassing situation for him. He had to withdraw his appearance. Then he said, give me a day's time, I will decide. Then I will. <laughs> then he withdrew his appearance and then appeared for the petitioner. And the respondents' cases, he withdrew his appearance. These things you have to be very careful while deciding. This is, this is, this is also a conflict of interest. That is, for the, same, for the same legal issue, you appear for both sides. Then you have a problem there. So that is that is one aspect which you should, you should be very careful. Then disclose the correct position of law and tell the client that if, if he or she is likely to lose the cause because of a settled position of law. Suppose there was a very lucid position of law, he bought a case and that got settled by the Supreme Court or by a division bench of the high court. Then you must tell him that this is the position. If you want, I will take the risk. Otherwise, I will not. Then argue the entire case. Do not leave out a point saying that according to you it is a weak point. A point which is weak according to you may be a very strong point from the point of view of the judge. Because we already saw what Justice Lord Broomwell said. A man's rights are to be decided by the judge and not by the attorney. So you don't decide which point you should. You can formulate the points, you can argue your stronger points first and weaker points later. But don't decide to leave out any point saying that it is weak. That may appear to be a very strong point for the judge. And you, when your opinion is solicited on certain issues, on any legal issue or a factual issue, give an honest opinion. And if there is another view possible, tell the client that there is another view possible also so that he is guarded. Then if your client wants you to fight a cause despite you having told him that he is fighting a losing cause, then you are, you are entitled to fight the cause and fight it using every legitimate means to bring success. Don't use illegitimate means. Use legitimate means to bring success. Do not exceed your brief and make a factual admission. You, because a factual admission made by a lawyer is binding on the client. A factually incorrect admission also made by a lawyer is binding on the client. An incorrect legal submission made by a lawyer or an incorrect legal concession made by a lawyer may not be binding on the client, but a factual concession made or a factual admission made, even if it is wrong, is binding on the client. Therefore, 
do not make a factual admission or argument. Do not enter into compromise or adjustment without the authority of the court. Because after the 1976 amendment, a compromise is to be signed by the parties in writing, signed by the parties. Of course, Supreme Court has said in exceptional circumstances. Certain matters, they say the lawyer's concession may also be treated as a compromise. But all those cases arose in the appellate side, not in the original side. Therefore, when you are on the original side, be careful, don't enter into a compromise without authority of it, authority from the court. These are the general rules. And of course, in criminal cases, you have a duty towards the client to fight for his cause, even if he is, even if you know that he is guilty. All, all of you would do better to remember the wisdom of Chief Justice Cogburn when he said about the legal profession, I quote, while an advocate should be fearless in carrying out the interests of his client, the arms which he weaves are to be the arms of the warrior and not of the assassin. Very beautiful words chosen. An advocate's arms should be arms of a warrior and not that of an assassin. He added, it is his duty to strive to accomplish the interests of his client per fas and not per nefas. It is his duty to the utmost of his power to seek to reconcile the interest he is bound to maintain and the duty it is incumbent upon him to discharge with eternal and immutable interests of truth and justice. If you can bear in mind these words, I think you will never err in the profession. Be a warrior when you fight the cause of your client. Don't use illegal means to succeed. That is, a, that is where he says it is his duty to try to accomplish, of, accomplish the interests of his client per fast and not per nafas. And per fast is duty the legitimate means, per nafas is illegitimate means. Don't use illegitimate means. And also remember that it is your duty it is incumbent upon him to discharge with eternal and immutable interests of truth and justice. Therefore, these three things, your duty to your client is very important, but at the same time, your duty towards the maintain towards the society is also important. Use legal means to succeed. Don't use unfair means, even if you have to succeed for your client. Then comes the last but not the least, the duty towards the state. What are the duties of a lawyer towards the state? The judiciary, as I already said, is the last hope of the common man. But the society, the profession in general, has got a duty towards the society also. Because the actions of the court or a lawyer affects the society more. And today we see in this pandemic situation, the court is forced to almost run the state. In PILs, in the form of PILs, we get repetitions for doing everything. Do this, do that. People come out with wonderful suggestions only during these days to the courts. Direct this to be done, direct that to be done, as if we are all, the judges assume the role of the administrators. So, there you owe your duty to the society. As a members of the, as members of the judiciary and members of the legal profession, they have a fundamental duty towards the state. Broadly, the, these duties can be summarized as follows. One, to discourage dishonest and dubious litigation. Two, lawyers should act honestly with learning, prudence, and patriotism. Three, he should be able to separate fraud, exaggeration, and doubt from fact and truth like a swan that separates milk from water. A lawyer who commences an unjust suit it is said, poisons the fountain of justice at its source and the evil effects are felt through the body of law. So if you commence an unjust suit, you poison the fountain of justice at the source. That, that is the effect of a lawyer who commences, action of a lawyer who commences an unjust suit. Do not corrupt a witness. Do not identify with your client and become interested in the conduct of the litigation. The duty to the client is not greater than the law itself, and the lawyer cannot claim immunity for a wrong, even if, he was, if it was done in the best interests of his client.
He cannot say something was in the interest of my client. Therefore, it is not illegal. No, you cannot do that. No counsel shall assume a role of a judge and seek a preliminary investigation into truth of a case. A counsel must remember that he is an officer of a court and a limb of the administration of justice, just as a judge is. So, a counsel duty to the, towards administration of justice is much more weightier than his duty towards the client. Of course, you have a duty towards the client, but even in the bar council rules, when these duties are specified, the first thing that is specified is the duty towards the court and the duty towards the profession. Then comes the duty towards the client. The seriatim arrangement itself will show that the duty towards the client is not does not supersede your duty towards the court and the profession. So try to don't uh, what you call don't overstep. Don't do things which are not permitted under law, though they are in, in the inter best interests of your clients. Uh, and if these principles are remembered, I'll just repeat the last paragraph only, the last few lines only. The duty to the client is not greater than the law itself, and the lawyer cannot claim immunity for a wrong, even if, if it was in the best interest of his client. No counsel shall be bound to conduct a case beyond a stage when his conscience will not perm permit him to do justice to the client. No counsel shall assume the role of a judge and seek preliminary investigation into truth of the case. A counsel must remember that he is an officer of a court and a limb of the administration of justice, just as the judge is. If the above principles are remembered, then I don't think any counsel could be blamed for acting against the interests of the client. Thank you, gentlemen. And with this, I conclude, wishing you all well. And in these times of, we hope that uh, we resume court work much earlier. And But however, this pandemic times have given us a lot of opportunity to learn. And we have been having these kind of webinars all over. And uh, I congratulate uh, T.S. Gopal and Associates for coming up with this venture. And I find there is a list of very illustrious speakers who had addressed before me and some of them want to follow me also, I would request the members of the legal profession to take advantage of the situation and improve their learning. I don't say you are not learned, you are all learned members of the bar, but you can still assimilate knowledge from whichever source that comes. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. Uh... There's just a few questions in the chat. Yes, Some, yes sir. Uh, uh, there's, uh, yes. Criticism of a judge, or a judgment rather. Criticizing a verdict by a lawyer would be viewed as unbecoming of a lawyer even if criticism were to be genuine. No, no, no. Genuine criticism of a judgment is you are entitled to. You are entitled to criticize a judgment you are entitled to say the judgment is not correct. And you have to, all that you got to do is you got to back up your view and say that this judgment is not correct. But criticizing the judge is wrong. I never said criticizing of the judgment is wrong. You can criticize the judgment, but don't criticize the judge. No, there is a difference. You can say that this judgment of Justice Subramanian is incorrect. But you can't say that Justice Subramanian is a fool because he has written like this. That is the difference. Yes. Yeah. The next one is uh, huh. legal aid. Maybe huh. Successful and senior lawyers don't get to appear in legal aid cases. Do you think it should be made compulsory or how to get a more, uh, the question looks to be like more eminent lawyers should come into the legal aid program. It may not See, be the you, topic, but. Uh, you can't make it compulsory because I'm also a member of the Tamil Nadu Legal Services Authority Committee. Yes. So you can't make it compulsory because it is not, uh, see, it, it, it's like, 
it depends on the person's mentality see i was uh, i had offered my services to legal aid but my, i never did a case because no no the legal aid center did not send me any briefs because the problem there seemed is see i was also nominated as a counsel for a particular institution within the high court but i never got any briefs from that the judge who was responsible for me being put in the panel called me and asked me why is this why are you not appearing then i told him when my clerk went there the person who was uh, uh, upper division clerk in that office says that i must go and see him i said i will not see him the judge said please don't see him let him not give you cases don't see him <laughs> these are all things which happened there so you can't say not all seniors seniors are ready to do legally but the thing is who is to approach them see what happens is it is like familiarity they see when uh, x y there are for 10 names as legal aid councils and uh, four of them go there regularly and say acquaint themselves with the officer concern and say hi sir good morning every morning you say there was one lawyer who used to say very jocularly there was one lawyer who was enrolled with us that guy whenever he he travel he take all the lawyers who are in south of madras take the beach road and this guy whenever he goes to the beach road he finds all these traffic constables will be there morning he will say good morning good morning good morning to all of them for the first time we were all wondering why he is saying good morning to all the traffic constables on the road for the first one month this guy was doing that then thereafter as a practice as they saw this guy the constable started wishing him and he started acknowledging now that you see the, the, the table has turned everybody thinks he is a vip and every constable on the road wishes him like that it happens you know when see when four or five people 10 people are there on the panel uh, two or three people go there every morning and say good morning to that clerk and he will say you know sundar he came yesterday yes this case i will assign to sundar about uh, anand gopal and came day before yesterday this case i will assign and a person who doesn't go does not get it so it is not uh, see these things happen this is my personal experience i had i was appointed and uh, i i never went there and i told my clerk that uh, what happened you just go and see we got this letter but no case has come my clerk went there and that uh, udc said ah chamber le okandanda case kodpangala no ask him to come here then i the judge called me and asked me why you are not appearing i said this is what happened the judge the judge said don't go let him not give you cases you don't so that, that's how it happens it is not see making it compulsory is not but there's one one uh, good thing that has happened now is for designation of senior senior advocates there is a uh, stipulation which has come in in the rules which says that pro bono work will also be taken into account so that is one important one step we have taken towards then people who would like to be senior advocates would at least start doing legal aid matters Uh, the next is uh, how do you charge a fair fee during the early days at the bar how much is high and how much is low at a young age it is difficult to put a value to your work how to go about with this uh, i see this uh, fee see at a young age yes you see uh, in the uh, as a lawyer was practiced in the appellate side for most of my career throughout throughout almost throughout my career i had never had the liberty of fixing my fee that is see what happens is it, it is all through contacts see a lawyer from krishnagiri or dharmapuri or namakkal or selam sends you a brief he knows the capacity of the client to pay in some cases he will send a bigger fee for a very small brief he will say this client is rich so you take more money and there will be another complicated matter where you will have to work for days together then the fee will be about 500 or 600 rupees or a few thousands then we have to do all that work it is not uh, in the early days yes you can't fix your fee you will have to do all the work you will have to 
and uh, in one case where i remember me and lakshmi narayanan we lakshmi narayanan argued a case for one and a half days before honorable justice s s subramanian that is a case on section 28 of the specific relief act whether the contract could be annulled after the decree a, a very legal point we went hammer and tongs we argued both of us argued for one and a half days the judge also reserved orders came out with a 40 page judgment explaining the scope of section 28 all whole lot of it and finally he concluded that even after the decree the contract could be annulled but after pronouncing the judgment the judge asked both of us did you see the value of the suit we were blinking then he said please at least now see this 2500 rupees for a 2500 rupees suit suit you fellows have argued for one and a half days before me and i have written a 40 page judgment but of course it's a very interesting legal question but how much will you charge that for the whole suit is only 2500 rupees how much will you charge that poor client so it is not the question of see once you are a senior lawyer see that's why i said even in 1940 kv krishna sami here says don't underbid so these things were happening in those days also if a lawyer says for 1000 rupees for a few, for a case the other lawyer will say i will do it for 500 rupees so this this uh, this you have to see somewhere you have to draw a line but the legal practitioners these rules are worthless i agree if you are to follow all lawyers will be only paupers today that is only for taxing that is not for uh, but there are people who pay better there are people who pay less it happens these things which you have to it is like uh, or you call you get more fee in a case where you do less work <coughs> and in some cases you get less fee and you do more work and uh, these are all things which will have to be yeah nowadays we have come to this firm culture individual lawyers have become a rarity today and the firms they fix up their fees so that uh, that saying that the uh, fixing of fees there is a difficulty will have to be a problem and this has to be addressed by the lawyers concerned only you should if you if, you, if it comes through a feeder lawyer from the mafsal districts you can tell him like that this is very difficult so you pay me more or pay me uh, something more much later or something like that you have to adjust yes a junior advocate is regular to a particular court and he understands how the court works mm. when a senior member of the bar not knowing about the court trend commits a mistake should the junior advocate interfere and help him out while he is representing in court or should he just watch him see it depends on the uh, mental makeup of the of the two concerned see if, uh, if it's a senior who is doing who is making a mistake and the junior knows that it is a mistake some here refers to that also he says there are some juniors who sneer at their seniors <laughs> that's the language used by them and uh, see these yes if a junior fumbles or commits a mistake a senior can come to the rescue but if a senior does it yes a junior can also go to the rescue of the senior but it should be better uh, what you call it can be handled better by the junior telling the senior going near him and telling him like sir this is what it is or trying to draw his attention or put it in a slip and pass it on to him without the without it being exposed see normally seniors don't like to be exposed by juniors okay the, then there may be a problem but uh, And these are all things that is why that is why i said uh, krishna sam mayor used the word tact the tactfulness of the junior must come to the fore at that point of time he can always put, write it in a piece of paper and pass it on to the senior so that the senior knows what it is and he can reframe his submissions as he likes there's one more of the three of a person who just passed out hmm. uh, his grievance appears to be that uh, he is given more clerical work and because there is no clerks mm. rather than learning how to represent a case or how to handle a client 
or have been involved in the discussions with the senior. Uh, his question is, uh, there are less clerks. I'm doing the clerical work, how to tackle this situation. See, but the doing clerical work is also important. And uh, I, I used to blame my senior for not allowing me to do clerical work. I never did clerical work. I never entered the registry uh, till my, say, about uh, first uh, seven or eight years in the bar. I never attended a vacation court, nor I walked into the registry. My senior one day said, your name is going to be put in the Guinness book. I asked him for what? He said, for a junior who has not attended vacation court in the first 10 years of practice. <laughs> See, these things happen. It is all, what do you call, peculiar situations in every office. See, some officers, they say you go to the clerks, particularly the appellate side officers in Chennai. I don't know whether it continues now. When you, when you join as a junior, first thing is you go with the clerk. You go with the clerk for first one or two months. See where the, where, where do you file cases? How was it passed? Go to the AE, sit with the AE, explain the mistakes, or run around with the clerk, all the file copy application. All these things you have to learn. But if that is going to be the only thing, the it is better for the junior to get out and choose a better office where he, he or she will be given court work. See, learning clerk, the learning the clerk's job also is important for a lawyer, I don't say no, but it should not be only the clerk's job. First few months of, say about six months, if you are asked to go to the office, do clerk's work, fine, it is good, you learn a lot, but after that, it is going to be difficult. It may not be. The next person is the 49-year-old person pursuing mm. law at this age. Mm. He wants to have some valuable advice from you. There's nothing wrong in pursuing law at the age of 49. There are a lot of people who have come late into the profession and they have shined very well. But uh, at 49, if you come, yes, if you have chosen to pursue law and you can start practicing at the age of 49, you complete at the age of 52 and you enter the profession at the age of 52, it may be a little difficult, but it is not unsurmountable. It may require a little more hard work from him to make a mark in the profession. There are a lot of people who retire and come. I know there was one man who was a head constable who retired and joined, uh, he used to practice in the high court. I don't know whether he's still around. And uh, But he, he used to create problems for the senior also. One day he got up and said, where is your senior? He said, my senior has gone home. <laughs> <laughs> that should not happen. So he, yes, there are a lot of people who come after retirement, not lawyers. See, there are people who are law graduates who uh, can go for a job resign or retire and come back to the profession. But there are people who have done law and they have never come back. They, there are people who have, who have come, after resigning, they go do law and then come to practice. There are a lot of people like that. Some of them are very successful. See, it depends on how you take the profession. It is not the age that matters. It is the industry that you are going to put in. That's why when I said that infinite capacity for hard work should be there. If that infinite capacity for hard work is there, and the second one that, uh, that uh, uh, the Edward Clerk Casey said is much more startling and no money. You should have infinite capacity for hard work and you should not have money. That will be That is the foundation stone for success in this profession. Of course, I don't say that you should be a pauper to become a successful lawyer, but that gives you a more, what do you call, more energy to work, to seek. The next person is, really is uh, we follow the British system. UK system is what we follow, the legal system. Hmm. Uh, UK and the Western legal system has allowed law firms and lawyers to advertise. Why not us? 
See, uh, that, that is a decision which has to be taken by the Bar Council and uh, as a judge, I don't think I should be commenting on that, but advertisement, then it, it becomes soliciting. So soliciting in the sense, see, that's why I said this is, a, this is, a, this is called a noble profession. And uh, all institutions in this, all, all limbs of this profession, say, take, take for example, the legal field. The court, the lawyer, the client, the three important constituents, all of them work on the basis of trust. So, once it is a work which is based on trust, a function which is based on trust, once you allow advertisements, it will become, you know, it will become an unholy competition. And uh, people will start advertising and saying, I am good at this, I am good at that. And one man called me and asked me, sir, are you a divorce lawyer? I said, what do you mean by a divorce lawyer? I'm a lawyer. There are, there are these specializations in the Western culture. Yes, there are, there, there, there are divorce lawyers. There are, uh, what do you call, uh, they now call this uh, a new type of lawyers who do only this uh, documentation work. Uh, like the conveyancing lawyers. These divorce lawyers and these conveyancing lawyers then there's funding lawyers, all these things are, they're all there in the Western countries. But whether that would, uh, all right, then if you're going to advertise, if you're going to institutionalize, who is going to conduct the cases of these Dardar Narayanas as, as said by Krishnaya? You become institutionalized, you become so professionals, you have firms, you have advertisements. You have a reading fee, you have a rereading fee, you have a blocking fee. What all fees that the, the, the lawyers have invented today? And in the Supreme Court, we have the new fee called uh, assurance fee. That is, if you want the senior to definitely appear your, for your case, you've got to pay him something more. I'm not commenting on your right to charge. I don't say no, but you have, you, have a, you have every right to charge, yes. But when you start advertising what happens, then will, will not that, uh, that fourth point, underbidding will also start? Don't you think there will be much more degradation of the profession? I don't know, I, because now, now I am on the other side of the fence. I don't have a right to comment upon this, but I am only voicing my honest opinion on it as a part of, as a person who's part of this profession for more than 30 years. Uh, to on the appellate side where the vagaries are much more than the original side or the rich side of it. But still, I don't think uh, that uh, we have reached that stage where everything can be institutionalized. And you know the cost of litigation in the other countries, particularly England. In England, you have, you have a divorce case, your entire estate is lost. Half is taken by the wife, the other half is by the lawyer. Then you are a pauper. You want that situation to come here? All right. You can advertise also. Uh, I think for paucity of time, will be the last question. Um, internship. Hmm. Should it be mandatory? Would it help a better uh, profession? Yes, it helps. But making it mandatory, I don't think uh, will help. See, it should come out of interest. See, what happens is this, this local, local colleges start making it mandatory from the first year. The first year student who comes and lands up in a high court judge's chamber as an intern, just tell me uh, uh, what is that they can do? A first year law student in a high court judge's chamber, what is the what is the job that they can do as an intern? Nothing, literally nothing, just coming and sitting in the court. That is not the purpose of internship. Internship, yes, it is good, but it should be, in my view at least, it should be from the third year. First two years, leave them alone, let them know the basics. And from the third year, they will know the system. Otherwise, uh, if you're going to put a first semester student in a judge's office, then it becomes difficult. And the easiest thing they can do to get internship is the judge's office. 
because we are more accommodative we say yes one judge i know had eight interns at one time from local agency so what is that they can do the if they are from the third year yes three years fine third year fourth year and fifth year you do internships fantastic it is really good for you but before that i don't think it is advisable and making it compulsory but compulsory will be very very difficult because you make it compulsory one high court internship or two high court internships compulsory we have law colleges in dharmapuri tiruvaru and where are you have got you have got government law colleges in all these towns i think the question was more about after completion more like a house surgency which actually we did have around 98 or so we did have this internships and it was remote that so this apprenticeship. apprenticeship i think that that apprenticeship. apprenticeship yeah so question apprenticeship, is more apprenticeship yes apprenticeship can be there apprenticeship should be there but uh, now with this five years law course and the internships having gaining momentum i don't think apprenticeship should be made compulsory that will be very and we have this bar exam also all india bar exam also is there and apprenticeship was there earlier the earlier apprenticeship which we had before the we are reading that in 70s they had apprenticeship that was much more the scheme was much more better you have to write an examination after apprenticeship particularly in cpc and civil rules of practice or criminal rules of practice then only you are enrolled that is that, that was the kind of apprenticeship which we had earlier and whatever you had this late 90s apprenticeship was different that was only a namke vaste apprenticeship but now with this internships which have come into be and the bar exam also introduced i don't think apprenticeship should come back apprenticeship because see already you enter the profession at 22 and uh, apprenticeship for one year or one and a half years or two years your entry is delayed you become 24 See that that uh, that gives you a distinct uh, disadvantage of entering the profession at a very late stage. So that I don't think apprenticeship will left to me. I don't think apprenticeship is required, but these internships can be encouraged. Thank you, Judge. It was uh, really informative one. Uh, I think I'm not saying it just for the sake of saying, but we did learn a lot. Thank and, you, thank you, thank you, Anand. Uh, that is uh, taken the pains and efforts to. And, prepare and deliver and before i part i must say that it was uh, your firm's partner who gave me this book on kv krishna sami <laughs> just is kalifulla he only gave that book he was a partner of ps gopal anand ko he only gave me that book and said you know you read this i donated that book to the bar council and now i had to pull it out from the net to read it again for this uh, So the nice experience. I also learned a lot. I learned, I read a lot of things, and it was a great surprise to me when I found Chief Justice Lionel Lee saying that in 1940 the profession was overgrown. It was uh, something which was a very great surprise for me. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all well. Thank you. Thank you.